the nerdy had a simmer. Hey guys, welcome to another video. Today I want to take this beautiful SA-315B Llama from Lukla Airport up to the Everest Base Camp. The South Base Camp that is, which is located on the territory of Nepal at 5,364 meters or 17,598 feet. That's pretty high up, isn't it? So before we take off, we need to take a look at a few performance charts to make sure that our helicopter is actually able to fly there. We need to take a look at the hover ceiling of the Llama in ground effect and out of ground effect. We will check for the best climb rate and we will look up the v &E speeds, so the velocity never to exceed. In order to work correctly with the aircraft or helicopter's performance charts, we need to know several things. The pressure altitude, the density altitude, the field elevation of our airport, the current atmospheric pressure or QNH, outside air temperature, as well as our helicopter's gross weight. So what is pressure altitude and density altitude? An aircraft's aerodynamic performance, among other things, depends on air density. The higher the air density, the more lift the airfoils can produce. If air density decreases, our airfoils will produce less lift and our engine needs to work harder to keep us in the air, eventually up to the point where we reach our helicopter's performance limits. Now air density depends on several factors, altitude and air pressure, the higher the altitude, the lower the air pressure, the less dense the air gets. Temperature. High temperatures also decrease air density. Humidity. This should tell us two things. If we fly at low altitudes in cool air and the surrounding air pressure is high, the engine's performance should be rather good. While we should expect a decrease in available engine power when we fly at high altitudes in warm air and with low air pressure. This means that even though the true altitude of an airport above sea level, which is what you would find on a flight chart, is always the same, the aircraft's actual performance may vary greatly on different days depending on the weather conditions. That's why we need to adjust the true altitude for the outside air pressure, giving us pressure altitude, and for the outside air temperature, giving us density altitude. Since you cannot produce performance charts for every possible weather situation, they have to be standardized. So in aviation, all aircraft performance data is referenced to a standard day, also called the International Standard Atmosphere or ISA. These standard conditions are defined as an outside air temperature of 15 degrees Celsius and an air pressure of 29.92 inches of mercury or 1013.2 hectopascals, both at mean sea level. Unless you happen to fly on a standard day, which is very rarely the case, you need to factor in the difference of the local surrounding air pressure, or QNH, to the standard air pressure, QNE, to find your height above or below the standard pressure. If the current QNH is higher than 29.92, you can expect the pressure altitude to be lower than what is indicated on your altimeter, meaning that the helicopter will perform as if it was flying a little bit lower. If the current QNH is lower than 29.92, you can expect the pressure altitude to be a little bit higher than what you read on your altimeter. That means that the helicopter performs as if it was flying a little bit higher. Since the pressure altitude does not factor in temperature, we also need to calculate the density altitude, which is defined as the pressure altitude corrected for a non-standard temperature. I know this is very confusing, but don't worry, I'm going to show you some examples. So let's jump right into the scenario. We are at Lukla Airport, Nepal at 9,700 feet. Outside air temperature is 1,2 degrees Celsius. QNH is 29.82 inches of mercury or 1,010 hectopascals. First of all, let's figure out our helicopter's weight. Our mission is to take three hikers with their baggage to the Everest base camp. Let's assume that each of the hikers, as well as the pilot, weighs 80 kilograms. They also bring along baggage and equipment that weighs another 80 kilograms, summing up to a payload of 400 kilograms. Now for the fuel planning. It will take us about 20 minutes to get from Lukla to Everest Base Camp. After the transfer, I want to fly back to Lukla, so Lukla will be my alternate airport as well. However, if the weather should turn bad along the way, there are also several helipads that I could land at, and a small airstrip called Siang Boche. Then I'll add my reserve fuel, which should be enough to keep the helicopter airborne for 30 minutes. 
and I'll add fuel for another 10 minutes of flying time as my contingency fuel. So I will need fuel for 80 minutes of flying time or 1 hour and 20 minutes. The average hourly fuel consumption of the SA315B Llama is 56 to 58 gallons per hour. I'm going to calculate with the higher number uh, just to be safe. Since 20 minutes are exactly one third of an hour, I can use this simple formula. 58 gallons times 4 thirds equals 77.33333333333. 77.33 gallons times 6.76 to convert to pounds of Jet A fuel gives me 522.77 pounds of fuel total. Keep in mind that if you're using different fuel than Jet A, uh, your conversion factor might differ. Of course, that's not of great concern in a simulator. Now, adding up our payload of 400 kilograms or 881 pounds. Our fuel of 522 pounds, as well as the empty weight of the helicopter, we get a gross weight of 3,655 pounds. One quick word about X-Plane's fuel calculation. As you can see, the uh, estimated flight time doesn't match with uh, what we've calculated. X-Plane actually shows us 54 minutes instead of 1 hour and 20 minutes. Simply meaning that X-Plane's flight time estimation is not necessarily reliable. The in-game fuel consumption of Philip Uben's Lama is correct. I checked for this. Uh, actually, it uh, uses a little bit less than the 58 gallons that I calculated with. First question is, can we actually land the helicopter at the Everest base camp with the given weather conditions and our gross weight? In order to safely land the helicopter, we need enough engine power to maintain a stable hover, at least for a short period of time. To find out whether that works, we will take a look at the hover ceiling charts of the Llama. There are two charts, the hover in-ground effect and hover out-of-ground effect. IGE meaning hovering close to the surface, making use of the ground effect, usually less than one rotor diameter above the surface. Logically, hovering out-of-ground effect means hovering higher in free air, so to speak, which has higher demand on engine power. Let's look at the hover ceiling IGE chart first. On the left-hand scale, we can see the pressure altitude in meters. On the right-hand scale, the same pressure altitude in feet. On the bottom scale, you see the helicopter's weight in kilograms or pounds. Finding out the pressure altitude of Lukla Airport is very easy. Simply set your altimeter to 2992 or 1013 hectopascals and read the indicated altitude. In this case, however, we will need the pressure altitude of Everest Base Camp. We will need to calculate it by using this formula. We take the field elevation of Everest Base Camp, 17,598 feet, plus 27 times standard barometric pressure minus current Q&H. To better understand, by subtracting the local Q&H from the standard barometric pressure, we get the difference in hectopascals. A change of one hectopascal equals a change in altitude of about 27 or 30 feet. 17,598 plus 27 times 1013.2 minus 1010. Pressure altitude at Everest Base Camp should be about 17,685 feet. So the aircraft actually performs as if it was flying 100 feet higher than what is indicated on our altimeter. Notice that if the outside air pressure or Q&H is higher than the standard pressure, the value becomes negative. In this case, we would have to subtract the difference in feet from the field elevation. That means that the aircraft might perform a little bit better as if it was flying at a lower altitude. You can calculate the same thing using inches of mercury by using the following formula. With that information, we can use the chart. Enter the right-hand scale of the chart at about 17,700 feet and draw a straight line to the left until you hit the outside air temperature which at the moment is minus 9 degrees at Everest Base Camp. From there, draw a straight line down to the bottom scale and read the weight of the helicopter. This is the maximum weight your helicopter can have to be able to hover in ground effect at a pressure altitude of 17,700 feet. The result is about 4,100 pounds. So with our 3,655 pounds gross weight, we are well within the limits uh, of an in ground effect hover. We could even pack another hiker and a little bit of fuel if we wanted to. 
By the time we reach the Everest base camp, we would also have burned off a little bit of fuel, so we would be even lighter than uh, we are right now. Now, let's see how high we can hover out of ground effect with our current total weight of 3,650 pounds. Enter the bottom scale at 3,650 pounds. Draw a straight line up until you get to an outside air temperature of minus 9 degrees. And then from there, draw a straight line to the right and read the pressure altitude. This means that we can actually hover out of ground effect up to a pressure altitude of 19,000 feet today. Now we will check the best rate of climb for our flight out of Lukla. For this chart, we will need our density altitude. The pressure altitude does not take into account the effects of air temperature changes on our aircraft's performance. So if it is warmer than the 15 degrees Celsius of a standard day, the aircraft will perform as if it was flying at a higher altitude. The pressure altitude corrected for a non-standard temperature is called the density altitude. For example, let's say you want to take off your helicopter from an airport that has a pressure altitude of 2000 feet. Air temperature decreases by about 2 degrees for every 1000 feet of altitude. So on a standard day with a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius at mean sea level, we could expect to have a temperature of 11 degrees Celsius at an altitude of 2000 feet. However, let's say that we have an actual outside air temperature of 30 degrees at 2000 feet. That means that it is 19 degrees warmer than on a standard day or ISA plus 19 degrees. To find out our density altitude, we need to take our pressure altitude and add 120 feet for each degree Celsius above standard temperature. Now you can see that even though our pressure altitude is 2000 feet, our helicopter will perform as if it was flying at 4000 feet. That's quite a dramatic difference. The hotter it is outside, the more the difference between pressure and density altitude. Now let's calculate today's density altitude for Lukla. First, we'll calculate our pressure altitude. Field elevation of Lukla Airport is 9,337 feet. Field elevation plus 29.92 standard pressure minus 29.82 current Q&H times 1,000 equals 9,437 feet pressure altitude. For the density altitude, we'll divide 9,437 by 1,000 multiplied by 2. That means on a standard ice a day, we would expect a temperature decrease at 9,400 feet of about 19 degrees or an outside air temperature at Lukla of minus 4 degrees. However, the actual air temperature at Lukla is 12 degrees plus. The temperature difference to a standard day, therefore, is 16 degrees Celsius. For every degree above ISA temperature, we will have to add 120 feet of altitude. So we multiply 16 by 120, resulting in us having to add 1920 feet to our pressure altitude to get the density altitude of Lukla. So our helicopter will actually perform as if it was flying at 11,350 feet. Now, finally enough for our best rate of climb. Enter the chart on the left-hand scale at the density altitude of 11,300. Draw a straight line to the right until you hit your current gross weight. We are at 3,650 feet, so pretty much in the middle between those two graphs here. From there, draw a straight line down and read your best rate of climb, which is about 1,400, 1,500 feet per minute. Now you do not necessarily have to climb that fast, it just means that this is the most effective rate of climb for your current load setting and the weather conditions. Last but not least, I need to find out the V and E speed for our current flight. As the name suggests, this is the maximum speed that we should not exceed in a helicopter or we might get into a retreating blade stall. Again, we will need the density altitude, but this time for Everest Base Camp. Now, if you don't want to calculate that much, you can also use a simple conversion chart. Enter the bottom scale at the current outside air temperature of Everest Base Camp, which is minus 9 degrees Celsius right now. Draw a straight line up until you hit the pressure altitude that we've already calculated of about 17,700 feet. And from there, draw a straight line to the left and read the density altitude. This is about 19,000 feet. 
Now take the V and E chart and enter it at the left hand side at 19,000 feet density altitude. Draw a straight line to the right until you get to the total weight of the helicopter at Everest Base Camp, which in our case will be 3,550 pounds. Then draw a straight line down and read the V and E speed in knots, which is 68 knots. I'm going to keep it at 60 to 65 knots just to be safe. Why a total weight of 3,550 pounds? Once we get to Everett's base camp, I figure we will have burned off at least 100 pounds of fuel. So let's sum up what we know now. With our current takeoff weight of 3,650 pounds, we are able to do an in-ground effect hover as well as an out-of-ground effect hover at Everest base camp. Our best rate of climb out of Lukla would be about 1,500 feet per minute. And once I gain altitude, I will make sure that I will not exceed an airspeed of 65 knots. With this information, we are ready to go, so let's fire her up and fly to Everest Base Camp. Before we start the engine, we have to set our Collins pitch indicator, which shows us how much collective pitch we are allowed to pull on this flight. For this, we need our pressure altitude in meters. Our pressure altitude was 9,437 feet at Lukla, which amounts to 2,880 meters-ish. Now we spin the outer ring of the instrument to align our pressure altitude of 2,880 meters with the current outside air temperature of 1-2 degrees Celsius. The white arrow on the lower right hand quadrant of the instrument now points to our density altitude of a little bit above 3,000 meters. Finally, we will move the little reminder bug in the upper right hand quadrant of the instrument to point at a little bit above 3,000 feet of density altitude. This will be the maximum amount of collective that we can pull on this flight. Switching on batteries and generator as well as our strobe lights, uh, which are our anti-collision lights, making sure that everybody knows that we're about to start the engine. Quick test of all the lights in the cockpit. Everything should light up and activate the fuel boost pump and time for 20 seconds. Let's have a look at the outside conditions. Uh, visibility is good, a little bit hazy, and we got a few clouds that we need to keep clear of. Before we flip the engine start switch to on, just make sure that the white lever, the fuel lever is all the way backwards and the fuel cut of lever the red one is in the forward position checking my temperatures and pressures and remember that in the llama as well as in the gazelle the turbine starts without engaging the rotor checking our fuel gauge we took about 77 gallons of fuel on board which should be about 350 liters the gauge shows us 325 however especially analog fuel gauges are never hundred percent exact for spooling up the rotors, make sure that the rotor brake is disengaged. That's something I would like to see in the Llama, that uh, if you load it up by default, the rotor brake would actually be engaged, and that the automatic setting of the Collins pitch indicator is not activated, which it is, uh, at least in my version here. I probably could change that uh, within the aircraft's config file if I knew anything about it. I'm slowly advancing the white lever forward until the rotors start to turn. Now wait for the rotor RPM needle to meet with the engine RPM needle. For our calculations in the first part of the video, I used the real-world elevation data for Lukla and Everest Base Camp. In X-Plane field elevation data differs sometimes. Uh, that might be due to the kind of mesh that is used, how accurately it depicts the uh, real-world terrain here. Alright, needles are married. I'm slowly advancing the fuel lever all the way forward. I don't know whether they use llamas at Everest. I know that they use a lot of AS-50s for passenger transport. Probably because they offer more room, are more modern and use less fuel. However, the llama is a very suitable aircraft for mountain flying. It was developed for hot and high conditions, I believe for the Indian Army. Let's activate our transponder. I'm squawking the VFR code 1200. 
Switching the ignition key off, the engine should remain running at flight idle. Then we're going to close the guard. Checking the overhead panel one last time before liftoff. Since I've seen some clouds and temperatures will drop below zero, I will activate the pyto heat. The pyto tubes are pressure sensitive instruments that give us information about our altitude and our airspeed. If those tubes get clogged up, for instance, by the accumulation of ice, our airspeed and our altitude readings would be false, which can prove to be disastrous. That's why there is a heating system that prevents icing. Remember, the power pedal is the right one, and the llama will hang a little bit right skid low, so you need to displace the cyclic a little bit to the right for a hover. Nuclear traffic helicopter 9 in November, Echo Bravo Charlie, SA315B Llama taking off runway 24, right crosswind departure, climbing 17,000 for the base can, Balukla. Accelerating forward to get into effective translational lift before entering my climb. We'll be flying northbound along the river Dot Koshi. Don't know if I pronounced that one right. If you're wondering about the scenery that I fly in, it's the Everest Park 3D by Frank Dainisi. It features very detailed depictions of uh, the airports of Lukla and Siang Boche. It also gives you a few helipads, among them is the Everest Base Camp that we are flying to today. The quality of the scenery is pretty outstanding, but you might find it a little bit pricey at 30 US dollars for a, well, rather limited area. Then again, if you compare it to the average price for a payware airport, you do get a good amount of uh, VFR scenery. And that's, uh, after all, what I'm looking for as a helicopter pilot. Our climb rate of 1,500 feet per minute lets us fly at uh, 50 knots. I don't want to get any slower than that. And as I gain altitude, I will also reduce my climb speed. As you can see, visibility is not too great, however, it's uh, good enough. We still have reference to the ground. Taking a helicopter flight from Lukla to Everest Base Camp is uh, quite a short hop. If you choose to walk the trail, it can take you up to uh, 14 days, depending on the weather. Walking distance is about 60 kilometers, and you need to walk at a slow pace to get acclimatized to the high altitude. Coming up on our left is the city of Namche Bazar, I believe, and the airport Siangboche, which consists of a dirt slash grass runway. see the airport in the top right corner and there's a helipad off to our right. It seems to be centered in a white runway, however this is an artifact of explains foggy weather. You don't see that white stripe in clear weather. The mountain on our left hand side is called Kumbiyula, according to Google Maps. 
And the big peak further ahead on the right should be the Ama Dabla. I leveled off at 15,000 feet here to get a little more airspeed. However, I try not to fly faster than 70 knots. comes a little village I think it's the village of Portsea but I'm not really sure there is also a helipad however the scenery is not as detailed as uh, it is at Lucla As the terrain rises, I'm going to get back into a slow climb. I'm going to limit my airspeed to 60 to 65 knots. We'll follow that glacier line up ahead and that should get us directly to the base camp. word about the VNE and retreating blade stall. Due to the phenomenon of relative wind, the airflow through the main rotor disc is different on the advancing and the retreating side. So when the blade moves forward, so against the slipstream that hits the helicopter in forward flight, it produces more lift. When the blade is retreating, so it moves with the slipstream, it produces less lift. This is called the symmetry of lift and it is the reason why we have to displace the cyclic a little bit to the left in the llama or else it would roll to the right. In order to counteract that tendency and to equalize the lift across the rotor disc, the rotor blades can actually flap up and down. This leads to the angle of attack of the rotor blade decreasing on the advancing side and increasing on the retreating side. If we are exceeding the V&E speed, the angle of attack of the retreating blade might get too big and it starts to stall. The higher we fly, the higher the angle of attack of the rotor blades to begin with. So at higher altitudes, B and E speeds are quite a bit lower than at low altitudes. This is also what we could see in the chart. First indications of an impending retreating blade stall are excessive vibrations and sluggishness of the controls. And eventually the helicopter will pitch up and roll into the retreating blade. You should reduce collective, pull aft on the cyclic and slow the helicopter down. To avoid this altogether, just know your V&E speeds at any given altitude. For a quick reference, you will find a V&E play card somewhere in the cockpit in almost any helicopter. Whether or not retreating blade stall is actually programmed into a helicopter flight simulation, that's another question, of course. Pepper's base camp you should see is now five miles to the southwest inbound for landing. Hold on to your tents. Still flying at 60 knots, I'm gonna start my descent here soon. I will try to come to a halt directly above the helipad and in-ground effect. The hikers at the Everest base camp will try to acclimatize themselves to the high altitudes by climbing up the mountain a little bit, then climbing down again and repeat, climbing up a little bit higher every time. Also, helicopters flying up to base camp will usually carry supplement oxygen on board. Everybody awake again? To be honest, there are a million places that I'd rather be than uh, within the death zone of Mount Everest. Then again, I'm not an avid climber. 
For some people, it seems it's a lifetime dream come true to climb Everest. How about you guys? Let me know in the comments. What I miss in some X-Plane flight models is that you cannot really feel the difference in handling characteristics when you're heavily loaded uh, opposed to a lightweight setting. Sometimes you just see it on the torque gauge and the TOT gauge. You might even have to push in a little bit more pedal. A simulation that is very good with this is Bell Simtex UH1 for DCS. And so was Dodo Sims uh, 206 for FSX. What a sight! I've been flying the MD500 a lot lately, so you can see me over controlling on this very sensitive uh, cyclic here. Alright, that's it. Hope you enjoyed our flight to the Everest base camp. Hope to see you around next time and be sure to subscribe and like. See ya!